little bit of statistics with practice problem 16 for the Praxis 5165 exam. We're told that the measures of hand spans, all right, of ninth grade students at some school are approximately normally distributed. When you see approximately normally distributed, you're thinking the bell curve. There's a pretty damn good one. When we're talking about our normal distribution, there's always two parameters, the mean, which you put in the middle of your picture. In this case, it says that the mean is seven inches, so this is seven, and then the standard deviation, one inch in this case, which is how much you count up and down by, and you wanna space things out so that by the time you're three standard deviations above the mean and three below the mean, you're pretty far out into the tail here. So maybe you put an eight right here, and a nine right here, and a 10 right here, that'll work. And then a six right here, and a five right here, and a four right here. And we'll pretend that those are evenly spaced out. The idea is that the area underneath this curve between any two bounds tells you two different things. This is true of any distribution, not just the normal distribution, by the way. The first interpretation of the area is its probability that a randomly selected observation falls in a given range. So if I ask the question, what's the probability that a randomly selected, what are these, ninth graders at Tyler High School has a hand span between nine and 10 inches. I just have to figure out how much area there is between nine and 10 here, assuming the total area underneath the curve is one or 100%. I'm not asked any questions about probabilities of randomly selected individuals, so this is not the interpretation of the area that I care about for this example. The second interpretation is it's the percentage of all observations that fall in a given range. So if I ask something like, what percentage of all ninth grade students at Tyler High School have hand spans that are between, I don't know, five and eight inches, all I'd have to do is figure out this area right here. Again, assuming the total area underneath the curve is one or 100%. If you read this question, what we're trying to figure out is which group is expected to have the greatest percentage of measures. In other words, is the percentage of all Ninth grade students at Tyler High School that have a hand measure less than six inches bigger than the percentage of all ninth grade students at Tyler High School that have a hand span, hand spun? I don't even know what that means. Whatever, greater than seven inches? Is that a typo? Should that be hand span? I don't know, I guess I'm just not gonna worry about it. Anyways, answering this question, there's at least two different ways you can do it. One way is using this thing called the empirical rule. Another name for the empirical rule is it's the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And what that tells you is that 68% of the area underneath the normal distribution, approximately, falls within one standard deviation of the mean. So the mean is seven, one standard deviation below to one standard deviation above comprises 68% of the total area underneath the curve. That's the 68 of the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. You might be able to guess that the 95 tells you that 95% of the area falls within two standard deviations of the mean. Two standard deviations below seven is five. Two standard deviations above seven is nine. The area shaded in red is 95% of the total area underneath the curve. That's the 95 of the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And I probably don't even need to tell you that the 99.7 part tells you the percentage of the area underneath the normal distribution that falls within three standard deviations of the mean. I'm worried that if I shade it in, it's gonna be hard to see. So maybe I'll just outline the area that I'm talking about. Damn near all, in other words, 99.7%, of the area underneath this curve falls in this green region right here. With the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, which by the way are approximations, the real area here isn't 68%, it's like 67.9 or 68.1 or something, I forget. But it's pretty damn close to 68%. Definitely close enough for our purposes. Using these three facts and the symmetry of the normal distribution, we can come up with the approximate area underneath the curve that falls in each of these different regions. And that tells us the percentage of all the observations that fall in each of the different regions. In other words, the percentage of all ninth grade students at Tyler High School with hand span or hand spun or something measures in a given range. So let's do it. First A, what percentage of these ninth grade students at Tyler High School have hand spun measures less than six inches? Maybe I can draw a new picture here. Here's my normal distribution. Here's seven in the middle, six, five, four, counting down by standard deviations on the left. 8, 9, 10, counting up by standard deviations on the right. In both cases, three standard deviations. It's pretty far out into the tail. Technically, this thing continues infinitely in both directions, but it gets so small you don't even have to draw it. Four and 10 are close to the end in big air quotes. Anyways, less than six inches is talking about this region shaded in brown. Can you figure out the area of this region? Yeah, you can, but you have to be a little bit clever. Since this region is bounded by six, it kind of makes sense to use the fact that 68% of the observations are between six and eight. This area is shaded in red. 
That doesn't directly tell you what you have in brown here, but if 68% is shaded in red, then the remaining 32% is not shaded in red. And taking advantage of symmetry, I know that the area shaded in brown here is the exact same as the unshaded area over here. If this plus this is 32%, and this and this are the exact same, then I must have 16% over on this side, and another 16% over on this side, because 100% falls somewhere. The group of hand span measures, that's what I'm gonna say is this is hand span, because I don't know what the hell hand spun means, that are less than six inches is 16%, give or take. Remember, the empirical rule is just an estimation. It's a pretty damn good estimation though. What about part B? Well, for part B, I don't even need the empirical rule. The group of hand span measures that are greater than seven inches, well, seven is the mean, and thanks to the symmetry of a normal distribution, Half of the area is above the mean, half the area is below the mean. I got 50% over here. What about the group of hand span measures that are between six and eight inches? First, let's draw the picture. Here's an ugly looking normal distribution, but whatever. Six to eight inches is this area shaded in green. The bounds of this area are exactly one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean. So the empirical rule tells me directly that this is approximately 68%. We got a new leader in the clubhouse. What about D? If D is greater than 68% is the right answer. If it's less than 68%, then C is the right answer. Hand span measures between five and seven inches. If you're good with the empirical rule, you should be able to calculate that exact area. But if you're clever, you should recognize that you don't even need to calculate that exact area. Because look, here's seven, six, five, four. I'll draw the eight, nine, 10, just for the hell of it. My bounds this time are from five to seven. Could you figure out this area shaded in pink? Yeah, absolutely. Do you need to? No. Nah. Why? Because what's shaded in pink here is less than 50%, right? Because less than seven would be exactly 50%, meaning that the pink shaded area and this little area over here sums to 50%, meaning pink is less than 50%. If this is less than 50%, it's certainly less than 68%. Sure sounds like C is the right answer. For the sake of education, if you wanted to figure out the approximate area shaded in pink, you could use the 95 of the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. The reason you'd know to use that is because five is two standard deviations below the mean. I know that the area from five to nine, which maybe I can outline in blue here, is 95% because five is two standard deviations below the mean and nine is two standard deviations above the mean. And then 95 in the 68, 95, 99.7 rule tells me exactly that. Think shaded in red up here in this picture. And then because of symmetry, Half of that 95% is shaded in and half of it's not shaded in. So the area in pink is half of 95%, which is 47.5%. This last area is 47.5%. The largest of these four numbers is the 68%. That's the right answer. That's the empirical rule. It's a good way to answer these questions. It works anytime we're talking about the normal distribution, where the bounds on the region that we're talking about are 0, 1, 2, or 3 standard deviations above or below the mean which frankly is what you'll likely see on the exam. If you found this difficult, you don't ever have to use the empirical rule because your calculator has a way of calculating these exact areas. Your calculator actually does better. The empirical rule is an estimate. The calculator will be a little bit more precise. The downside to using the calculator is you have to remember where this function is, and a lot of people don't. But if you're the type that likes to use a calculator instead of kind of deducing the answer through steps like this, or if you don't wanna memorize these three areas, let me show you how you can do the same thing on your calculator. You're probably thinking this is a statistics question. So what I'm looking for is probably under the stat menu. Unfortunately, it's not. This is a normal distribution question. So what you're looking for is under the distribution menu, which is kind of hidden. It's written above the variables key here in blue. So I'm gonna hit second and then variables to get into the distribution menu. The function that I want is normal CDF. Normal, because I'm talking about the normal distribution and CDF stands for cumulative distribution function. Cumulative meaning the total area between two different bounds. If I hit enter on normal CDF, one of two things will happen. Depending on the software you have on your calculator, it'll either just open up the function normal CDF and assume you know what inputs it's looking for, or it'll bring up a separate screen that'll tell you what the four inputs of normal CDF are. The four inputs of normal CDF, in case your calculator doesn't tell you, are the lower bound, the upper bound, the center, and the spread which in the case of the normal distribution will always be the mean and the standard deviation. If I wanna use the normal CDF function, I gotta give it these four arguments in this order separated by commas. So for example, let me jump down to C here. I'll go back and do A and B in just a minute. Instead of estimating this area to be 68%, 
what I could do is use the normal CDF function on my calculator. The lower bound would be 6, the upper bound would be 8, the mean would be 7, and the standard deviation would be 1. If I type this in my calculator, it'll tell me this area right here a little bit more precisely than 68%. Let me show you. I've got normal CDF in here. I put in a 6, and then I hit this comma. There's a special key for commas, and then an 8, and then a comma, then a 7, then a comma, then a 1. You don't have to close your parentheses. You hit enter, and it'll spit out that area, 0.6827, if I'm rounding to four decimal places. What we see is this estimate of 68% was pretty good, but a better estimate would be 68.27%. You don't need to be this precise for anything on this problem, so the empirical rule is perfectly sufficient. We can do that same thing for D here, except now my lower bound and upper bound change to five and seven respectively. My mean is still seven, my standard deviation is still one, so the only inputs that I need to change are this six and this eight. If you're clever, you'll hit second and then entry to pull up the most recent entry, and then just go back and edit this entry, change this six into a five, change this eight into a seven. Hit enter and it'll spit out this area. We estimated it to be 47.5%, but with this normal CDF function, we see that a better estimate is 47.72%. What about A and B? Well, remember for A, we're looking for less than six inches, and that's a little bit tricky because the normal CDF function asks you for a lower bound and an upper bound, but if it just says less than six inches, we have an upper bound, but we don't really have a lower bound. In that case, you could just put in a zero for the lower bound, because nobody's gonna have a hand span measure that's less than zero inches. Realistically, you can put in any number that's less than like three or so, because the area to the left of three is so small that it's not gonna affect your calculation at all. I again wanna use the normal CDF function. The quick way to do this would be to hit second and enter again to pull that last line back up. But just in case you need a reminder, the way we found this normal CDF function is we hit second and then variables to get into the distribution menu. And then we selected the second thing here. You'll never use normal PDF, the normal probability density function. You'll use normal CDF, the normal cumulative distribution function. My calculator doesn't have the software that asks me for the lower bound, the upper bound, the mean, and the standard deviation. So I have to know that those are the four values that it's looking for. The lower bound, maybe we put in zero. The upper bound is six in this picture. The mean is still seven. And the standard deviation is one. Hit enter, and it tells me that this area, which I ballparked to be 16%, using this empirical rule, is really more like 15.87%. Close enough. I mentioned earlier that technically this distribution continues forever to the left and the right, so you might argue that a better way to figure out the area below the 6 is to pull up this entry, and instead of putting a 0 here, put in like, I don't know, some really large negative number. But note that if I put in negative, I don't know, 9999999999 and then hit enter, the answer that I get is basically identical to the answer that I calculated above. In fact, the 10 decimal places or whatever of accuracy that it shows are the exact same if the lower bound is 0 or if the lower bound is negative 9999999 because there's so little area to the left of 0. Finally, part B, can you think of what you put into the normal CDF function to figure out this area? I mean, you shouldn't have to use the normal CDF function to figure out this area. It should be obvious that the area is 50%. But if you wanted to do it on your calculator, do you know how you'd do it? It'd be nice if you did. We're going to use normal CDF. My lower bound is 7. I don't have an upper bound, so I put in any sufficiently large number. Any number larger than like 11 or so will be fine. I don't know, 99, that'll work. And then a 7 and then a 1 for my mean and standard deviation. I'll hit second and then enter to pull up the most recent entry. No, I won't, that's kind of ugly with all those nines in there. I'm gonna clear this out. I'm gonna hit second and then variables to get back in the distribution menu. I'm gonna select normal CDF, the second thing listed here. My lower bound is seven. My upper bound is any large number, 99 will do. My center is seven and my spread, the standard deviation is one. If I hit enter, I get really, really close to 50%. 49.999999, rounds to exactly 50%. I actually don't know why this isn't 50%. I know it's really close to 50% and I shouldn't worry about it, but 99 should be sufficiently far enough to the right so that there should be basically no area to the right of it. So I'm not quite sure why this isn't showing up as 50%, but I guess I'll just let it go. Two different ways you can do this question with the empirical rule, Downside there is you have to be a little bit clever in terms of how you draw those pictures. Or with your calculator function, downside there is you have to memorize how to use your calculator.